swallowed up by mercy's hand A feather of beauty where you stand Away to another land. The sweetest welcome from the Father. Gathered up and carried home. We are past this time of waiting. Come, let us bow before your throne. Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you all here tonight. Dawn, welcome. I didn't see you come in. Hi, Linus. Why don't we get started? Open with prayer for us, would you, brother? The floor is yours. Sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh -huh. Dearly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to gather around it tonight and take time to really delve deep into the pages of your word and study it. Father, and just see, seriously study it and see what it has to say for each one of us. Thank you for. I and for 
started this group so many years ago. And now it's steadily grown to the point where we can have weekly Bible studies around your word. I just ask your blessing on the study tonight. And hopefully if it's in your will, may more people come. And help us to be able to apply the truth, the truths we hear about tonight in your word to our daily lives. In Christ's name, amen. And amen. Thank you, Vio. Well, let me just say this, as I do every week, this is a discussion and not a lecture. Please feel free to contribute ideas, thoughts, insights, comments, relevant scriptures, and questions. But please hold those questions to the end because I am a sucker for rabbit trails. I said I am a sucker for rabbit trails. Oh, well, I guess I don't get the rabbits. There it is. Thank you, Vio. <clears throat> having said all of that and having gotten the rabbit, let us begin, shall we? Now we're talking. Thank you, Dawn. We are continuing tonight our current series, What is a Christian? Last week, we discussed the characteristic of agape love in answer to the question posed by our series title, What is a Christian? <clears throat> in the opening of last week's discussion, I quoted where Jesus made the clear statement, A new commandment I give unto you. That ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. From John 13, verses 34 and 35. <clears throat> Now, in his commentary that we saw last week of Jesus' words, Albert Barnes had a series of cross-references directing us to the admonitions and instructions that presented to the believer about expressing that love, agape love. Tonight, we're going to look at and examine each of those cross-references in their biblical order, in the order that they appear in the New Testament, one at a time from Matthew to Revelation, although there's not a representative cross-reference in each of those books, but in that order, Matthew to Revelation. <clears throat> now, this sort of is similar, but it is a cross-reference and is a valid cross-reference. So first, let's take a look at John 15, verses 12 to 13. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. On the night before his crucifixion, and he says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And the Sermon Bible tells us of this, quote, The death of Christ, our only stay. If the thoughts of sin, death, and judgment be so terrible, as in truth they are, to every soul of man, on what shall we stay ourselves when our time is at hand? Number one, first upon the love of God in giving his son to die for us. <clears throat> this is our first foundation, that God loves the world, that he looks upon the works of his hands with an eternal and steadfast love, 
with a tender, yearning compassion. Let me stop right there for a second. And I'll be brief because I have a lot of material for you tonight. We have heard, I, I presume, we have all heard the phrase that God loves us with an everlasting love. Everlasting is a synonym for eternal. Think of this now. There has never been a time in all eternity past when God has not loved us. And so this phrase here, that he looks upon the works of his hands with an eternal and steadfast love, is true. He has loved us from eternity past. He knew that there was a time way in the future that we would arrive on this planet as living human beings. And his love for us was already there. Whatever is doubtful, that is sure. Light does not pour forth from the sun with a fuller and directer ray than does perfect and eternal love overflow from the bosom of God upon all the works that he has made. God's creative love alone would be enough to fill, to still our fears and to show us that if any perish, it is not because he's austere, but because they are evil. The whole will and kingdom of God is love. And to him in that kingdom, we may come with boldness of hope and trust. That is number one about our foundation and our stay. Number two, we have as a second foundation on which to build our trust, the love of the Son in giving himself for us. Being in the form of God, he emptied himself of his glory. His Godhead, he could not lay aside. His Godhead, he could not lay aside for us. But he took to himself something the dearest and most precious to the soul of man. <clears throat> he took our nature, and therein a life the most loved and priceless of all the gifts of God. There is nothing to be compared with life. We cherish it as our very self. It's the center of every care, the end of all our labors. Such he took unto himself, and thereby he possessed himself of something he might give for us. <clears throat> Number three, in Christ's death were united the oblation of a divine person and the sanctity of a sinless man the perfection of the holy will and the fulfillment of a spotless life, the willing sacrifice of the sinless for the sinful, of the shepherd for the sheep that was lost, of life for the dead. How this wrought atonement for the sin of the world, we cannot say further than is revealed. How the guiltless could take the place of the guilty. How the penalty due to our sin could be laid on any but ourselves. Above all, on one who was sinless. Must at least in this our wayfaring. <clears throat> must at least in this our wayfaring on earth. Be a mystery. Unsearchable. And a depth past finding out. In this life, it is enough for us to know that he hath, quote, tasted death for every man, unquote, and that there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That's from H.E. Manning 
in a publication called Sermons, Volume 3. <clears throat> but this is just the beginning of our review of this verse. Alexander McLaren adds to this, John 15, 12 to 13, the oneness of the branches. The union between Christ and his disciples has been tenderly set forth in this parable of the vine and the branches. We now turn to the union between the disciples, which is the consequence of their common union to the Lord. The branches are part of one whole and necessarily bear a relation to one another. And unfortunately, in our current world, relation to fellow Christian <clears throat> is has been strained and divided by political considerations, wherein people put the conditions of temporary political opinion before the eternal relationship with their brother and sister in Christ, such that churches are being divided over these political these political distractions that's the word i want we may modify for our present purpose the analogous statement of the apostle in reference to the lord's supper and as he says quote we being many are one body for we are all partakers of that one bread so we may say the branches being many are one vine, for they all are partakers of that one vine. <clears throat> of this union amongst the branches, which results from their common inher inherence in the vine, the natural expression and manifestation is the mutual love which Christ here gives as the commandment and commends to us by his own solemn example. There are four things suggested to me by the words of our text. <clears throat> and I love when Alexander McLaren does this. He takes a verse that we could basically read and say, okay, what, and what's the next verse? <clears throat> and now he puts it through the prism of his own brilliant mind to show us the depth and all the things we can get from it. There are four things suggested to me by the words of our text. The obligation, the sufficiency, the pattern, and the motive of Christian love. So let's look at those four. <clears throat> And then violinist says, but he splits it into 120 different ways. The man is a is a the man is a genius violinist. He he just is. And thank God for him. And thank God that he wrote these uh, these thoughts and comments, and perceptions down for us to read 150 years later or so. <clears throat> Number one, first, the obligation of love. The two ideas of commandment and love do not go well together. You cannot pump up love to order. And if you try, you generally produce what we see in abundance in the world and in the church. Sentimental hypocrisy, hollow and unreal. Let me read that again. You cannot pump up love to order. And if you try, generally produce what we see in abundance in the world and in the church. Sentimental hypocrisy, hollow and unreal. <clears throat> but whilst that is true, and whilst it seems strange to say that we are commanded to love, still we can do a great deal directly and indirectly for the cultivation 
and strengthening of any emotion. We can either cast ourselves into the attitude which is favorable or unfavorable to it. We can either look at the facts which will create it or at those which will check it. Sorry, folks, having a little trouble cutting and pasting here, if you'll bear with me. We can go about with a sharp eye for the lovable or for the unlovable in man. We can either consciously war against or lazily acquiesce in our own predominant self-absorption and selfishness. And in these and in a number of other ways, our feelings toward other Christian people are very largely under our own control and therefore are fitting subjects for commandment. <clears throat> Our Lord lays down the obligation which devolves upon all Christian people of cherishing a kindly and loving regard to all others who find their place within the charmed circle of his church. <clears throat> It's an obligation because he commands it. He puts himself here in the position of the absolute lawgiver who has the right of entire and authoritative control over men's affections and hearts. And I just want to say again, as I think I said here last week, <clears throat> that you will never turn on the news one night and see and hear the man say, well, Congress just passed a new commandment. The issuing of commandments is within, exclusively within, the realm of deity, the realm of God. So here, this is basically a, an admission or a declaration that Christ is identifying himself as God. We all know the Ten Commandments. His disciples all knew the Ten Commandments. The Pharisees and chief priests all knew the Ten Commandments. But what does he say? I'm giving you a new commandment. Only God can do that. And Christ is and was God. And he could do that and did do that. <clears throat> and it is further obligatory because such an attitude is the only fitting expression of the mutual relation of Christian men and women through their common relation to the vine. If there be the one life sap <clears throat> circling through all parts of the mighty whole, how anomalous and how contradictory it is that these parts should not be harmoniously concordant among themselves. And it may be contradictory but sadly, it is also all too true. <clears throat> However, unlike any two Christian people are to each other, in character, in culture, in circumstance, the bond that knits those who have the same relations to Jesus Christ one to another is far deeper, far more real, and ought to be far closer than the bond that, needs, that knits either of them to the men or women to whom they are likest in all these other respects and to whom they are unlike in this central one. Alexander McLaren made that same statement in his other commentary, you may remember, about Jesus saying, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Christian men, Christian women, you are closer to every other Christian man and woman 
down in the depths of your being, however he or she may be differenced from you, are the things that are very hard to get over than you are to the people that you like the best or love the most. If they do not participate with you in this common love to Jesus Christ. I dread talking mere sentiment about this matter. For there is perhaps no part of Christian duty which has been so vulgarized and pawed over by mere unctuous talk as that of the fellowship that should subsist between all Christians. And without saying it, what he has said, what he is saying is <clears throat> that should but does not subsist among, between all Christians. I have one, one plain question to put. Does anybody believe that the present condition of Christendom, we're looking at the 1880s here and nothing has changed, if anything it's only gotten worse, that the present condition of Christendom and the relations to one another, even of good Christian people in the various churches and communions of our own and other lands, is the sort of thing that Jesus Christ meant? Or is anything like a fair and adequate representation of the deep, essential unity that knits us all together? <clears throat> is the circum are the circumstances that we find the interrelationships of Christian people, of believers in God and believers of his word, are we living what Christ meant us to live, is what he is asking. I'll leave that, that answer to you. We need far more to realize the fact that our emotions toward our brothers and sisters in Christ are not matters in which our own inclinations may have their way. <clears throat> but that there's a simple commandment, commandment. Let's not forget that that's what it is. It's a commandment. There's a simple commandment given to us and that we are bound to cherish love to every man and woman who loves Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Never mind, though, he does not hold your theology. There are variations of Christian understandings and beliefs and practices that God still accepts. Read Romans 14. So never mind that, though, he does not hold your theology. Never mind, though, he may be very ignorant <clears throat> and narrow as compared to you. Never mind, though, your outlook on the world may be entirely unlike his or hers. Never mind, though, you be a rich man and he be a poor one, or you a poor and he rich, which is just as hard to get over. Let all these secondary grounds of union and of separation be relegated to their proper subordinate place. And let us recognize that the children of the one Father are brethren. <clears throat> let us recognize this, that the children of one Father are brethren. And do not let it be possible that it all be that it shall be said, as so often has been said, and said truly, that quote unquote brethren in the church means a great deal less than brothers in the world.
That's a sad statement. And that's only his first point. Let's look at his second point. Number two, note secondly, the sufficiency of love. Our Lord has been speaking in a former verse about the keeping of his commandments. Now he gathers them all up into one. Quote, this is my commandment, that ye love one another. Unquote. All duties to our fellows and all duties to our brethren are summed up in or resolved into this one germinal, encyclopedical, all comprehensive simplification of duty <clears throat> into the one word love. Where the heart is right, the conduct will be right. Love will soften the tones, will instinctively teach what we ought, what ought to be, what we ought to be and do. Will take the bitterness out of opposition and diversity. Will make even rebuke when needful. Only a form of expressing itself. If the heart be right, all else will be right. And if there be, any, be a deficiency of love, nothing will be right. You cannot help anybody except on condition of having an honest, beneficent, and benevolent regard towards him. You cannot do any man or woman in the world any good unless there is a shoot of love <clears throat> in your heart towards him. You may pitch him benefits, and you will neither get nor deserve thanks for them. You may try to teach him, and your words will be hopeless and profitless. One thing that is required to bind Christian men and women together is this common affection. That being there, everything will come. It is the germ out of which all is developed. As we read in that great chapter <clears throat> to the Corinthians, the lyric praise of charity or agape love, all kinds of blessing and sweetness and gladness come out of this. It is the central force which, being present, secures that all shall be right, which being absent, ensures that all will be wrong, or shall be wrong. And, it is not, and is it not beautiful to see how Jesus Christ, leaving the little flock of his followers in the world, gave them no other instruction for their mutual relationship? He did not instruct them about institutions and organizations, about orders of the ministry and sacraments or church polity and the like. He knew that all these would come. His one commandment was love one another. And that will make you wise. <clears throat> Love one another and you will shape yourselves into the right forms. He knew that they needed no exhortation such as ecclesiastics would have put in the foreground. It was not worthwhile to talk to them about organizations and officers. These would come to them at the right time and in the right way. The one thing needful 
was that they should be knit together as true participants of his life. Love was sufficient as their law and as their guide. <clears throat> Number three, note further the pattern of love. As I have loved you, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Christ sets himself forward then, here and in this aspect, as he does in all aspects of human conduct and character as being the realized ideal of them all. <clears throat> and although the thought is a digression from my present purpose, I cannot but pause for a moment to reflect upon the strangeness of a man thus calmly saying to the whole world, I am the embodiment of all that love ought to be. You cannot get beyond me, nor have anything more pure, more deep, more self-sacrificing, more perfect than the love which I have borne for you. And that is exactly what Christ has said by telling us, by commanding us to love one another as I have loved you. That love is, is as pure and as deep and as self-sacrificing and as perfect as is possible. <clears throat> the passing that. Butler, greetings. I didn't see you come in. Welcome. But passing that, the pattern that he proposes for us is even more august than appears at first sight. For if you remember a verse or two before, our Lord has said, <clears throat> As the Father had loved me, so, I, so have I loved you. Now he says, love, love one another as I have loved you. There stands the three, as it were, the Father, the Son, and the Disciple. The Son in the midst receives and transmits the Father's love to the Disciple, and the Disciple is to love his fellows in some deep and august sense, as the Father loved the Son. <clears throat> the divinest thing in God, and that in which men can be like God, is love. In all our other attitudes to him, we rather correspond than copy his fullness is met by our emptiness, his giving by our recipiency, his faithfulness by our faith, his command by our obedience, his light by our eye. <clears throat> August means... Um, Oh, how would I put that in? How would I put that into words? I'll define that later, Butler. If you want to stick around after violinists' closing pieces, and thank you for the question. But here is not a case of correspondence only, but of similarity. My faith answers God's gift to me. But my love is like God's love. Be ye therefore imitators of God as beloved children, and having received that love into your hearts, ray it out, and walk in love as God also hath loved us. 
<clears throat> but then our Lord here in a very wonderful manner sets forth the very central point of his work. Even his death upon the cross for us as being the pattern to which our poor affection ought to, ought to aspire. And after which it must tend to be conformed. <clears throat> I need not remind you, I suppose, but our Lord here is not speaking of the propitiatory character of his death. And by propitiatory, what he means is that thing, that offering, that enables the Father to forgive us. <clears throat> Nor of the issue which depend upon it and upon it alone, namely, the redemption and salvation of the world. He's not speaking either of the peculiar and unique sense in which he lays down his life for us, his friends and brethren, as none other can do. <clears throat> he is speaking about it simply in its aspect of being a voluntary surrender at the bidding of love for the good of those whom he loved. And that he tells us that and nothing else is the true pattern and model towards which all of our love is bound to tend and to aspire. That is to say, the heart of the love which he commands is self-sacrifice, reaching to death if death be needful. And no man or woman loves as Christ would have loved, would have him love who does not bear in his heart affection which has so conquered selfishness that if need be, he is ready to die or she is ready to die. <clears throat> Expression of Christian life is not to be found in honeyed words or the indolent indulgence of, indulgences of, bene, of benevolent emotion, but in self-sacrifice, modeled after that of Christ's sacrificial death, which is, a, which is imitable, by us. And by imitable, he means what we can imitate. <clears throat> Brethren, it is a solemn obligation which, well, which may well make us tremble, but is laid on us in these words, as I have loved you. Calvary was less than, a 20, was less than 24 hours off. And he says to us, that Calvary is your pattern. <clears throat> Contrast our love at its height with his. Drop to an ocean. A poor little flickering rushlight held up beside the sun. My love at its best has so far conquered my selfishness that now and then I'm ready to suffer a little inconvenience, to suffer, or rather to sacrifice a little leisure, to give away a little money, to spend a little dribble of sympathy upon the people who are its objects. <clears throat> Christ's love nailed him to the cross and led him down from the throne and shut for a time the gates of glory behind him. <clears throat> and he says, that is your pattern. Oh, let us bow down and confess 
how his word, which commands us, puts us to shame. When we think of how miserably we have obeyed. And Butler says true. And I say amen to that, Butler. <clears throat> Remember, too, that the restriction which here seems to be cast around the flow of his love is not a restriction in reality, but rather a deepening of it. He says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But evidently he calls them so from his point of view. <clears throat> and as he sees them, not from their point of view, as they see him, that is to say, he means by friends, not by those who love him, but by those whom he loves. <clears throat> and let's not forget that he died for us when we were his enemies. As it says in Romans 5, and not his friends. So he teaches us here <clears throat> in what seems to be a restriction of the purpose of his death and the sweep of his love that the way by which we are to meet even alienation and hostility is by pouring it upon, or is by pouring upon it the treasures of an unselfish self-sacrificing affection which will conquer at the last. Christ's death is the pattern for our lives as well as the hope of our hearts. <clears throat> Mr. McLaren is quite, not quite done yet. He has another point. Number four. Lastly, we have here by implication though not by direct statement, the motive of the love. Surely that too is contained in the words, as I have loved you. Christ's commandment of love is a new commandment. <clears throat> not so much because it's a revelation of a new duty, though it is a casting of an old duty into new prominence, as because it is not merely a revelation of an obligation, but a communication of power to fulfill it. <clears throat> the novelty of Christian morality lies here, that in its law is a self-fulfilling force. We have not to look to one place for the knowledge of our duty and somewhere else for the strength to do it. But both are given to us in the one thing, the gift of the dying Christ and his immortal love. <clears throat> that love received into our hearts will conquer, and it alone will conquer our selfishness. That love received into our hearts will mold, and it alone will mold them into its own likeness. That love received into our hearts will knit, and it alone will knit all those who participate in it into a common bond sweet, deep, sacred, and all victorious. <clears throat> and so, brethren, if we would know the blessedness and the sweetness of victory over these miserable, selfish hearts of ours, and to walk in the liberty of love, we can only get it by keeping close to Jesus Christ. In any circle, the nearer the points of the circumference are to the center, the closer they will be 
to one another. <clears throat> As we draw nearer each for himself to our center, we shall feel that we have approximated to all those who stand round the same center and draw from it the same life. In the early spring, when the wheat is green and young and scarcely appears above the ground, it comes up in the lines in which it was sown, parted from one another and distinctly showing their separation and the furrows. <clears throat> but when the full corn in the ear waves on the autumn plain, all the lines and separations have disappeared, and there is one unbroken tract of sunny fruitfulness. And so when the life in Christ is low and feeble, his servants may be separated and drawn up into rigid lines of denominations and churches and sects. But as they grow, the lines disappear. I love that analogy. <clears throat> what a beautiful word picture. If to the churches of England, <clears throat> where Alexander McLaren was at the time in Scotland, but let's say to the whole world, if to the churches of the whole world today there came a sudden accession of knowledge of Christ and of union with him, the first thing that would go would be the wretched barriers that separate us one from another. For if we have the life of Christ in any adequate measure in ourselves, we shall certainly have grown up above the fences behind which we began to grow and shall be able to reach out to all that love the Lord Jesus Christ and feel with thankfulness that we are one with him. <clears throat> Unquote. From Alexander McLaren. And finally, tonight, the preacher's homiletical tells us this. Not servants, but friends. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do the things which I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known unto you. <clears throat> Ye did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go, that ye should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye may love one another, from John 15, 13 to 17. These words of our Lord are the charter of our emancipation. They give us entrance into true freedom. They set us in the same attitude towards life and towards God as Christ himself occupied. <clears throat> Without this proclamation of freedom and all it covers, we are the mere drudges of the world, doing its work, but without any great and far-reaching aim that makes it worth doing, accepting the tasks allotted to us because we must, not because we will, living on because we happen to be here, but without any part in that great future towards which all things are running on. give us true freedom and to make this life a thing we choose with the clearest perception of its uses and with its utmost and with the utmost ardor our lord makes known to us all that he heard of the father what he had heard of the father all <clears throat> all that the spirit of the father had taught him 
of the need of human effort and of human righteousness, all that he grew up to manhood, he recognized of the deep-seated woes of humanity, and all that he was prompted to do for the relief of those woes, he made known to his disciples. The irresistible call to self-sacrifice and labor for the relief of men and women, which he heard and obeyed, he made known and he makes known to all who follow him. He did not allot clearly defined tasks to his followers. He did not treat them as slaves, uh, appointing one to this and another to that. He showed them his own aim and his own motive and left them as his friends to be attracted by the aim that he had drawn him, by the aim that had drawn him, and to be ever animated with the motive that sufficed for him. But it made his life so glorious, so full of joy, so rich in constant reward, he knew it filled their lives also. And he leaves them free to choose it for themselves, to stand before life as independent, unfettered, undriven men and women, and choose without compulsion what their own deepest convictions prompted them to choose. A quote-unquote friend is not compelled blindly to go through with a task whose result he does not understand or does not sympathize with. A friend is invited to share in a work in which he has a direct personal interest and to which he can give himself cordially. All life should be the forwarding of purposes we approve, the bringing about of ends we earnestly desire. All life, if we are free men and women, must be matter of choice, not of compulsion. <clears throat> And therefore Christ, having heard of the Father, that which made him feel straightened until the great aim of his life could be accomplished, which made him press forward through life, attracted and impelled by the consciousness of its, of its infinite value as achieving endless good, imparts to us what moved and animated him, that we may freely choose as he chose and enter in into the joy of our Lord. <clears throat> this, then, is the point of this great utterance. Jesus takes our lives up into partnership with his own. He sets before us the same views and hopes which animated himself and gives us a prospect of being useful to him and in his work. If we engage in the work of life with a dull and heartless feeling of its weariness or merely for the sake of gaining a livelihood, if we're not drawn to labor by the prospect of result, then we have scarcely entered into the condition our Lord opens to us. <clears throat> It is for the merest slaves to view their labor with indifference or repugnance. Out of this state, our Lord, out of this state, our Lord calls us by making known to us what the Father made known to him, by giving us the whole means of a free, rational, and fruitful life. He gives us the fullest satisfaction moral beings can have because he fills our life with intelligent purpose. <clears throat> he lifts us into a position in which we see that we are not the slaves of fate or of this world, 
but that all things are ours, that we through and with him are masters of the position, and that so far from thinking it is almost a hardship to have been born into so melancholy and hopeless a world, we have really the best reason and the highest possible object for living. <clears throat> He comes among us and says, let us all work together. Something can be made out of this world. Let us with heart and hope strive to make of it something worthy. Let unity of aim and of work bind us together. This is indeed to redeem life from its vanity. He says this, and lest any should think, this is fantastic. How can such a one as I, as I am, forward the work of Christ? It's enough if I get from him salvation for myself. He goes on to say, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. <clears throat> It was, he says, precisely in view of the eternal results of your work that I selected you and called you to follow me. It was true then and it's true now that the initiative in our fellowship with Christ is with him. So far as the first disciples were concerned, Jesus might have spent his life making plows and cottage furniture. No one discovered him. Neither does anyone now discover him. <clears throat> it is he who comes and summons us to follow and to serve him. He does so because he sees that there is that which we can do which no one else can. Relationships we hold, opportunities we possess, Capacities for just th for, for for just this or that, which are our special property, into which no other can possibly step, and which, if we do not use them, cannot otherwise be used. <clears throat> Does he then point out to us with unmistakable exactness? what we are to do and how we are to do it? Does he lay down for us a code of rules so multifarious and significant that we cannot mistake the precise piece of work he requires from us? He does not. He has but one sole commandment, and this is no commandment because we cannot keep it on compulsion, but only at the prompting of our own inward spirit. He bids us to love one another. He comes back and back to this with significant persistence and declines to utter one other commandment. In love alone is sufficient wisdom, sufficient motive, sufficient reward for human life. It alone has the adequate wisdom for all situations, new resource for every fresh need, adaptability to all emergencies, and exhaustible fertility and competency. It alone, love alone, can bring the capability of each to the service of all. <clears throat> Without love, we beat the air. That love is our true life or rather, let me say that again, that love is our true life is shown further by this, that it is its own reward. When a man's life is, any intellig is, in, is in any intelligent, start again, when a man's life is in any intelligible sense, 
proceeding from love, <clears throat> when this is his chief motive, he's content with living and looks for no reward. His joy is already full. He does not ask, what shall I be better of thus sacrificing myself? What shall I gain by all this regulation of my life? What good return in the future shall I have for all that I'm losing now? Those aren't the questions he asks. <clears throat> he cannot ask these, these questions if the motive of his self-sacrificing life be love. Just as little as the husband could ask what reward should he have for loving his wife. A man would be astounded. It would scarcely know what you meant if you asked him what he expected to get by loving his children or his parents or his friends. Get? Why, he does not expect to get anything. He does not love for an object. He loves because he cannot help it. And the chief joy of his life in these unrewarded, and the chief joy of his life is in these unrewarded affections. <clears throat> Affection indeed induces companionship, but also companionship produces affection the honest and hopeful endeavor to serve Christ loyally will have its reward in a deepening devotion. It's not the recruit, but the veteran whose heart is holy, his, is holy his chiefs. And he who has long and faithfully served Christ will not need to ask where his heart is. And if, by long service, we can win our way to an intimacy with Christ, which no longer needs to question itself or test its soundness, in that service we may most joyfully engage. For what can be a happier consummation than to find ourselves finally overcome by the love of Christ, draw with it all the force of divine attraction, convinced that here is our rest, and that this is at once our motive and our reward. Unquote. <clears throat> From the preacher's homiletical. There is much more to say about agape love as a vital and indispensable characteristic of what is meant to be a Christian. God willing, we will be we will be reviewing more about this viral, vital characteristic next week at the same place and time. And I invite all of you who are hearing or reading my words to join me next week. We ran a couple minutes over. I apologize for that. But we're still not done, violinist. Would you favor us, brother, with a piece or two on the violin? The floor is yours. Thank you. 
Hmm. Hmm. That's different. 